Thank you for joining me. My name is Rick Peltier of the Department of Environmental Health Science at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. I'm an atmospheric chemist by training uh, and I'm an exposure scientist. I'm interested in human health and public health uh, and how we can engage the public with this kind of data. Uh, I titled my talk today uh, kind of whimsically as Friday Face Air Quality, uh, communicating this diet, d data to the broader community. Uh, we need to take the, the information that we can get from some of these wonderful sensors that we have available to us and make it packaged in a way such that anybody can access the results and perhaps take action from that. Uh, the problem with air quality data historically is that it sometimes looks like this. Uh, this is simply a mess. Uh, it's what you might call a horrible gram. Uh, this information is so complex and so detailed and so granular that it's almost impossible to make heads or tails of what it's trying to tell us. It might impress your dissertation advisor as a, if you were a doctoral student, but it doesn't impress the general public. This is too much information that misdirects the message you're trying to convey. As a result, as air atmospheric scientists, we have to make a concerted effort to simplify this data into something like this, that's easier for somebody to intuit and understand and comprehend. But at the same time, we can't simplify too much because as we go beyond data, it becomes a simple uh, threat or uh, a, a, an acknowledgement of security and safety, you know, green happy face, for example, this misses the message. There's a lot of granularity and texture in air quality data, particularly those produced by, by these sensors that are on the market, uh, and we have to be sure we don't lose that message. But in order to get that message conveyed properly, we have to recognize what truth is. Uh, but I view that there are really three truths in the world. There are political truths and personal truths and scientific truths. Uh, these truths are, uh, they, they overlap with one another and they're not completely separated from one another, of course. Political truths are really defining the best way to seek some sort of answer. It's often a group of people who have some kind of political belief and they have a consensus, it's a belief, that this is the best way forward. A personal truth is the most personally meaningful or empowering or moralistic way to seek an answer. Uh, that's very often uh, highly personalized and individualized and it varies from person to person, of course. Scientific truth is the fact-based method for seeking an answer. When we look at sensors and how they engage truth, for in my book, I look at the bottom two here, personal and scientific truths are the way that we can use data to in, encourage action to protect people from uh, harm's way of some things like degraded air quality. Uh, scientific truth, of course, these things produce fact-based data. Uh, that data has uncertainty with it, of course, as we all know, uh, but what we don't think about as we deploy and use and develop these sensors is that there's a personal truth. Uh, and that's where we sometimes fail getting that message to the general public. Because even if I have a perfect sensor that is absolutely precise, if I don't believe that air quality is important, I won't care. So our charge is to find ways to make that personal truth more important for the general public. What we look at with truth, and this is related to both personal and political truths, are communicating risk. Communicating risk is a really challenging area. It's hard to understand for the general public, but it's even harder to explain to others because risk is deeply personal. What one person views as risky isn't necessarily what the other person would view as risky. That your risk perception is different than my risk perception. And when we're trying to convey a personal truth on air quality, we have to recognize that not everybody views risk the same way. So where do low-cost sensors fit into this equation? Well, we have to recognize that, uh, that because just because we have dozens and hundreds of sensors doesn't mean uh, that they equal data quality. Uh, ubiquity is not synonymous with, with quality. Uh, if you put a terrible sensor out, uh, it will produce terrible data. And if you put 100 terrible sensors out, it will produce hundreds of terrible data. That doesn't mean it's useful. Uh, low-cost sensors, though, despite the fact, even when they have flaws, uh, they lead to a democratization of data. And that's, to me, one of the most exciting parts of low-cost sensors, because you can start to democratize the measurement of air quality. Historically, it's been the, of the purview of regulators and academics. Uh, citizen scientists often didn't have access to the resources to do, to do that. 
most of most excitement is how you can engage things like justice and, and uh, equities uh, in environmental the environmental sciences. Very often there are environmental injustices in the world that are overlooked by either the traditional research community or the funding agencies, or it's a simple, a simple matter of how do we allocate limited resources to address all of the problems in our state or country or community. Low-cost sensors promise to democratize this responsibility. They can allow others to start to investigate. Perhaps a local emitter that might be a small time, a small emitter in a small community, but it's a concern for the community. They can now have access to at least preliminary data to suggest that, hey, maybe there's a problem here. Maybe this can be used to justify more information and more investigation. But these low-cost sensors, we have to be very careful because some models are black box models, which means that the data is produced in some uh, mysterious way that perhaps involves data massaging. I'm not saying that all methods are, are, um, are, are negative or, or harmful, but we have to recognize that we need to have some transparency when it comes to uh, sensor data because if we don't have transparency, we won't have trust in that data. And that's what questions that scientific truth. I also recognize that people want to own their data. When somebody produces an air quality sensor data set of, of pollution, for example, they have an ownership in that. They have a stakeholder re relationship with that data. And that's really, really important. So we can empower people to democratize data. If we can do it in a transparent way, uh, we can produce higher quality data. And it's data that people are excited about. And as an academic, I'm excited about low-cost sensors because they provide an opportunity for us to exploit really high-level, sophisticated understanding of environmental phenomena uh, in ways that we never have before. We're getting data from every corner of the Earth. We're getting uh, replicates of data in, in different locations and times. Uh, and while the analyses are still a little uncertain, we don't really know where the future is going to go, I remain positive. I remain excited about this. But just because we have a low-cost sensor data out on the market doesn't mean we're going to have spectacular data that everybody's going to respond to. The fact is, as scientists, we don't do a very good job with that scientific communication aspect. So we often need to partner with those who are experts in that. And I would look towards journalists to help us with that message. You know, po politicians for years have used talking points to craft their message, to stay in line and to, to hammer home the same kinds of principles. That is part of the, that political truth we talked about. These talking points, you know, you might be cynical about politicians, but the fact is they are effective strategies to communicate. Why can't we in the air science, the air sensing community, use the same kinds of talking points to communicate messages to the general public, particularly those related to public health and risk? we should use those talking points as well. But as experts in this field, we also have to recognize that we have a curse of knowledge. We have a, an incredibly granular understanding of how these sensors work, what conditions they can operate in, uh, whether they're stable or robust, they're precise or accurate. All of these features are things that we intuitively know because this is what we do for a living. The fact is the vast majority of the world doesn't do that. They don't have that under, underpinning knowledge in how these sensors work. Uh, when we communicate with the general public with this data, we either take the assumption that they simply don't know and we, we just explain using jargon and technical terms, or that they do know and we just skip over all the details. That's a failure on our part, and we're not addressing this curse of knowledge that we're all carrying. We have to meet the general public where they are. We have to be aware of our own language, the way we describe things. We have to have empathy for their position, and that's not something you hear in very many scientific talks, but when we're trying to craft a message to the general public, we have to be empathetic to their needs. Using journalists or partnering with journalists to get this message out is an essential way to do this. Journalists are outstanding communicators. That's what they do for a living. They may not have training in atmospheric science or measurements or meteorology, but they are good writers and they are good orators and they are good storytellers. But at the same time, they have deadlines. They have to produce their work by five o'clock this afternoon to get that story done. So they're under intense pressure sometimes to get these messages right. Uh, and that's where I bring us back to these bullet points, these talking points. They're really effective strategies to, to hammering home that same message over and over again. At its core, journalism is storytelling. Uh, we have to think about uh, the data that we produce from a sensor as a character in that story. Uh, and if we can think of it that way, we can 
tee up that message for journalists and get that message more widely disseminated. Lastly, I want to talk about messaging with data. Uh, we have to recognize that what data, what these data produce, what these uh, these sensors are producing for an individual, a citizen scientist, for example, is an answer to some question that's important to them. As a scientist, I might be interested in maybe photochemical kinetics of a particular reaction, so I might use a sensor to address that answer. But a citizen scientist or somebody who just has a, a sensor who's sitting at home uh, isn't probably interested in photochemical kinetics. They might be interested in things like Am I going to have an asthma attack today? Or can my, my children play outside on the playground? Is it safe for them to do so? Those are the kinds of questions that people are seeking to address. And those are the kinds of questions I would encourage you to try to answer with your sensor data. I'd also point out that there are lots of imperfect devices on the market as well low-cost sensors and, and even high-cost sensors that aren't particularly good. They produce uncertain data, they sometimes drift, they're imprecise and so forth, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that device is useless. Uh, there's lots of examples in the world of how data being produced by something is uncertain, but we still consider it as important to learn and to consider in our lifestyle. For example, we all know that when there's a 60% chance of rain uh, tomorrow, that there's a 60% chance of rain. We don't get really upset if it doesn't rain tomorrow because frankly, there was a 40% chance it wasn't gonna rain anyways. And lastly, I'd point out that uh, it's important to note that we are trying to make uh, low-cost sensors uh, a priority of modifying individual behavior. Uh, it's a tool that can be used to uh, coax individuals into taking risk reduction measures. Uh, as I mentioned, people are interested in trying to protect themselves from those questions that are important to them. Is it safe for me to go outside? Can my children play? Those kinds of questions are important. And we're using low-cost sensors, even the imperfect ones, to try to shape that personal truth. Talking about uh, there are lots of examples where we're trying our very best to shape our personal truth, but we don't always get there. We ought to have a healthy diet and perhaps lose a little weight, or maybe we want to get some more exercise or reduce our screen time. We don't always get there. We try, sometimes we fail, but we try again the next day. My hope when it comes to low-cost sensors is that that sensors can be used to help shape that narrative. To, but we can only do that if we can communicate this message more broadly and with the general public. Uh, I, I think all of us are interested in using low-cost sensors for this end, uh, but it's gonna take some practice and it's gonna take some persistence and we're gonna have to do this over and over again until we get the message right. And that's the whole point of doing this. So you use low-cost sensors to collect actionable data so individuals can take risk reduction measures and protect their health.